Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 21, and we'll begin reading in verse number 33. And this is the parable of the wicked husbandman. And I want you to notice that it's plural, okay? And it's not the wicked husband. <laughs> it is the wicked husbandmen, husbandmen. So there is a group of these uh, men, and we begin reading in verse number 33 of Matthew 21. Hear another parable. There was a certain householder, uh, we would say landowner, which planted a vineyard and hedged it about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out, that is, rented it to husbandmen and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits thereof, or the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first. So the first time, evidently, he sent three servants. Now he's sending more. And they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir, come, let us kill him, and see, let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him, and cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. When the Lord thereof of the vineyard, uh, when the Lord thereof of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? Now, the Lord is talking to the Pharisees, so he's asking them the question. He's told part of the story, and uh, really he's told the story, and now he's asking this questions in verse 40. When the Lord thereof of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? Now, they're sort of caught between a rock and a hard place, and they have to answer um, honestly. They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men and let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the Scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. They, they understood that he was speaking and giving this parable and, and it applied to them. They, they recognized that. And so verse 46 is their response. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the people because they took him for a prophet. Now, uh, surprisingly, the word parable is found 19 times in the Old Testament. Uh, we usually uh, normally think of parables being limited to the New Testament, but there are 19 times that the word parable is found in the Old Testament, and it's found in seven, seven different books of the Old Testament. Uh, the wicked husbandman in this parable illustrates the rejection of Christ the rejection of the Messiah himself by the Jewish nation, especially the priests, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, that is, the religious leaders of the nation. And that is verse 45. He said the chief priests and Pharisees heard this. And so it is a picture of Jesus being rejected. And uh, the servants who came are a picture of the prophets that Jesus uh, sent, and the God sent prophets all the way. Moses is called a prophet, and he sent prophets all the way through. There were prophets in David's life, Saul. There were Samuel. There were the judges. There were Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, Ezekiel, Daniel. All those men are the prophets who came to proclaim the Messiah, 
and uh, they were mistreated, they were judged, they were killed, many of them. And so this is a, this is a very uh, uh, particular parable that deals with the Jewish nation, of course, deals with the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Uh, so Jesus, at the end of this, he delivers a very solemn warning of the consequences that would follow. And uh, it says they wanted to take him, but if you will go to the last verse, or verse number 47, and uh, let me find that verse very quickly. I want to read that. Uh, you'll probably beat me to it, but I'll, uh, I want to read that. In chapter 21, Matthew, and verse number 33, and uh, we're going to go down to verse number 47. Uh, now we're going to go to verse um, um, verse 42. The stone which the builder rejected, the same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And look at verse 43. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And then he talks in 44 about the phone stalling on them or them falling on the stone. And the stone is this truth that he is portraying here. And so he is talking about a judgment that is coming upon the Jewish nation as a result of them rejecting the Messiah. Uh, if you remember in our previous studies and somewhere along the way we've mentioned this, that in 70 A.D. the Romans came into Jerusalem and destroyed Jerusalem, and they also took away captives. They leveled, basically leveled the city, leveled the temple, and so God turned them over to the Gentiles, and God let them destroy Jerusalem, which is Mount Zion, which is the city of David. And so we find that this is the end of uh, the parable, is that God is going to allow the nation of Israel to be not destroyed, not annihilated, but but attacked and and in a sense uh, destroyed uh, of its because it has killed the prophets and crucified the Messiah. Now look in verse 33, and I want you to notice the meticulous care for the vineyard. Notice how this householder, this owner, this landowner, marks off space. Okay, he's got this huge, we would say today, a plantation. He marks off a corner of that plantation, probably many acres uh, and its vineyards. He planted, the Bible says in other places, he planted it with the choicest of vines. He uh, enclosed it with a hedge. Now the hedge here does not mean that it was a bush hedge like we think of. Sometimes the hedges are made of stone, sometimes made of wood. Sometimes they were uh, thorns that were surrounded uh, 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 the uh, vineyard to keep out the animals, thieves, and other things. And uh, it would keep out those, uh, you know, Solomon talked about the little foxes that spoil the vines <clears throat> and keep out the thieves that would come in and, of course, take the grapes. And so he marked off the space. He planted it. He had to plow it. He had to cultivate it. He had to uh, make it soft to receive the seed of the grapes, and then he enclosed it with a hedge for protection. The Bible says he digged in a wine press, and the wine press was made up of two parts. They usually built it on a little slope, and on the top of that slope, they would build the wine press where uh, there was a huge, uh, usually concrete kind of um, uh, container up there, large enough for two or three men to get into, and they put all the grapes in there, and they would trod down the grapes and that would squeeze all the juice out, and the juice would flow down a, uh, a viaduct or down a tube or down a hill into a cistern that would catch the grape juice. So that's how they separated. They didn't have the machinery that we have today, and so they had this wine press up high, a little bit higher, and it would flow down into this, this cistern. We could call it a cistern, or the wine vat is what it was called. The Bible says he also built in it a tower, a tower for the watchmen and the laborers. Sometimes these towers are so huge they were used as 
uh, dormitories for the husbandmen. They would be several, uh, I mean, 80 feet tall. Sometimes at the bottom, they'd be about 30 foot square. Uh, and they also put watchmen up there to watch the uh, vineyard and to make sure the thieves didn't come in. Another second way of protecting that. And then they would, uh, of course, watch for the animals coming in. And so they, he did everything. He did everything that was necessary uh, to make it a well-supplied vineyard. And he spared no labor. He spared no expense. He furnished it in such a way to ensure its fruitfulness because he is going to get a part of, uh, of the fruit of this, uh, this um, vineyard. The Bible says he then let it out or rented it to tenant farmers for an agreed part of the grapes. They didn't exchange money. He just said, you take it. And sometimes it was a set amount. Sometimes he would say, okay, I want a... Uh, a hundred bushels of grapes out of this. And so regardless of how much it produced, he would get a set amount. Or he would say, I want um, 25% of all the harvest uh, of the grapes when it all comes in. He left his servants, he left his servants probably there to tend to his own vineyards, to tend to his own, we would say again, plantation, uh, he probably had other things that were planted. And so he left servants behind for two reasons, to tend to his own uh, interest, his own uh, farm or uh, plantation, and then he left them there to receive, to gather the grapes that belong to him according to the contract he had with these people. Now, if you will, find Isaiah chapter 5. Brother uh, <clears throat> Dallas is going to put that on the monitor for us, but if you want to turn there, you can. And there's exactly what God does through Nehemiah. He gives them exactly the same parable, the same comparison uh, in the Old Testament concerning the Jewish nation as he did here in Matthew 21. In chapter 5 of Isaiah, verse 1, he says, Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved, touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard and a very fruitful hill. So it is like the Lord is singing to the Son, uh, the Son of God. The Bible says in verse 2, listen to this, it's, a, it's very so similar. He fenced it in, gathered out the stones thereof, he cultivated it, and notice, and planted it with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press, and he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. He said, I planted this vineyard. This is Jerusalem, and this is Israel. God planted them, and God wanted them to be a nation that gave the people the word of God, and through the Jewish nation, the Old Testament did come through the Jews, and uh, he said, I put it there that for the, you know, really says another place for the blessing of the nations. And he said, I want to be a fruitful here. I did all this. Jesus asked in Matthew 21, what more could I have done? And now look in verse 3. And now the inhabitants of Jerusalem, men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard, that is between me and, and Jerusalem and Israel, and he says, what could have been done more to my vineyard than I have not done in it? He said, what are you saying? He's saying to the people of Judah and Israel, he is saying, what more could I have done? You started out with the choices of vines. Everything was there to produce a wonderful harvest and have pure grapes. And you brought forth wild grapes, which speaks of their waywardness from God and their idolatry and all the things that would, that would be included in a description called the wild grapes. In verse 5, and, go to again, and, go, uh, and now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. And here's the same thing. Here's the same problem. Same judgment that's going to come. I will take away the heads thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. 
and I will lay it waste. That's what the Romans did when they came. It shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah his pleasant plan. And he looked for judgment, that is, he looked for justice, righteousness. But behold, oppression. For righteousness, behold, a cry. Instead of righteousness, he said, the people cry out for deliverance because of the oppression that was put upon them by the leaders. In verse 8, Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place, that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. And now we'll go back to Matthew chapter 21. And so Isaiah uses that same picture, that same parable, that same illustration of a vineyard not ha that has been, uh, in, a, in the difference is in the Old Testament parable, we find that they God just let them come in, took down the hedge, and destroyed the nation. That is, they went into captivity. In the New Testament that we looked at, we found out that God... Uh, and uh, let the Romans come in, of course, and he marked them off, and God did not bless the nation of Israel. And uh, he goes on to say that after he had made all this meticulous care for his vineyard, it did not bring forth the grapes. It brought forth grapes, but the people, the nation itself, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Israel as a nation. Now, there were individuals in that nation who loved God and got saved. There were individuals like uh, the apostles. There were individuals like Anna and Simeon down at the temple who waited for the coming Messiah. There were those who others who found and, and uh, was looking forward to the prophecy of the coming Messiah. But we find here that they took very, very much care for the vineyard. Now notice, secondly, his masterful application to the Jewish nation. He has a masterful application. Here is the master teacher with a detailed parable revealing the nation's rejection of the Messiah and the curse of God, the judgment of God that would follow Notice, first of all, as we've mentioned, the planting of the vineyard. The Bible says in that Old Testament passage that he tilled it, he got all the stone out, he got it, the soil prepared, he planted it, he got everything ready. All it had to do was grow, and instead of that, in that day, the husbandmen, the people of Israel and Judah, they come in and they... They were. They brought forth wild grapes. They they cursed the. They cursed uh, what God had blessed and brought the judgment of God and captivity upon the nation of Israel. And so there's a masterful illustration here of the Jewish nation. The Bible says in verse 33. Here another parable. There was a certain householder, planted a vineyard, hedged it about, digged a wine press in it, and behold, a tower and let it out to husband, and went away into a far country. And so in this, in this case, you know, Jesus is coming, and he's gone away into a far country. And so this parable has to do with you and I also. The time that Jesus has gone away, the time that Jesus has left us the, and, and left the nation of Israel is really who it belongs to. But the Bible says back in Isaiah that he took the choicest of vines, the planting of the vineyard. He, listen, you know who it started with? It started with Abraham. And Abraham was a choice vine. Abraham walked by faith. Abraham heard a voice and came out of there with the Chaldees and went into the promised land and God blessed him and he's the father of the Jewish nation and he was a choice vine, a man who never seen God, who never did nothing except hear the voice of God and left his home, left his family, left everything behind. And the Bible says he went to a place that he, that he knew not of. He walked by faith and from him came Isaac and from Isaac, Jacob, and then the twelve sons, and from there uh, multitudes of Jews were, were born and spread across the world through these captivities. 
But I'm saying he planted the vineyard, and it was a it was a choice seed. It wasn't just something uh, he gathered together somewhere. This was choice seed. This was what God planned. This is how meticulous he he was careful about how he planted his vineyard. And then you'll notice the protection of the vineyard. You think of Abraham when God protected him when he uh, had an episode of unbelief. And he went down to Egypt because of the famine. And then there the king, the Pharaoh, took uh, Sarah. But through all of that, God protected Abraham and Sarah and his family. You think of the kings. There were five nations and the armies who went after Lot and Sodom. And they kidnapped Lot and his entire family and all that he owned. And yet uh, Abraham with just 318 servants conquered those five kings and got Lot, the Bible says Lot, and all that he possessed and his family and brought them back safely. God was protecting the nation of Israel. You think about the things that we've studied recently in the book of Joshua. You think of the Philistines and the Canaanites among whom he lived. And so here they are. They, they lived and, and uh, we understand that God protected him there. God let him make treaties there. They let it, that Abraham became a respected man in the land of Canaan. Uh, they let him choose a burying place for Sarah. And so on and on it goes, the protection of the vineyard. And then Isaac and then Jacob came. And God protected them. God protected Isaac when he was there in Canaan. And he was digging the wells. And the Bible said the Philistines would come and fill up the well. And he dug another well. And the Philistines would come and fill in the well and just persecuted him. The Bible said one day he digged the well. And he got good well and good water. And the Philistines then did not bother him after that. What was that? That's the goodness of God and the protection of God you think from Egypt 400 horrible years of slavery but through Moses he was protected he was protected in those 400 years Israel the nation of Israel and through Moses through the 10 plagues that God protected his people the Bible says there was there was darkness in the dwelling places of the Egyptians but there was light in the place of the Jews you think of Pharaoh chasing him through the Red Sea, protection. You think of 40 years in the wilderness, protection, provision, water from a rock, manna from heaven. You think of Joshua and all those Canaanite wars that we just preached on and gave messages on. 400 years when the judges ruled. That was 400 years and then the kings and Saul and David and Hezekiah and Josiah. And when uh, the city of uh, Jerusalem was, was besieged by the Assyrians and people were eating one another's children and, and it was a horrible scene. And one day 185,000 of those Assyrians were outside the city and they couldn't go out and couldn't come in. But there are some men who said, listen, we may as well go out there. And we may as well, because we're going to die in here, go out and die at the hand of the Philistines. It doesn't matter. Or the Assyrians. And the Bible says they went out there and 185,000 Assyrians were dead. And all their, all their spoil, all their tents, all their silver, all their gold, all their, all their food, all their animals were sitting out there. And the lepers came back and said, listen, they're, they're, the Assyrians are dead and there is riches untold. And the people went out and they were able to eat and take the spoils of those who had beseeched them. God, I'm saying God protected his people. And right now today, God is still protecting his people. The Arab nations are still trying to destroy Israel. And from time to time, you'll hear about it. I've, I've heard missionaries talk about uh, and one had a video on there of them, uh, the, the um, what do they call that group that starts with H, Halazba. Uh, somebody help me out here. You know what I'm talking about? Hezbollah? Hezbollah? Anyway, they were lobbing these missiles over into Israel. He could actually see them. You could see them going off in the distance. You could see them from this missionary's home. They're still trying to do that. Still hate the Jews. They say they are God's people, but they came from Ishmael. They didn't, came from, they didn't come from Isaac. They came from Ishmael. And then notice the last, the third thing, the last thing in verse 35, is the murderous acts 
of the husbandman. So we saw this meticulous care. We saw his masterful application to the Jews. And now the murderous acts of the husbandman. Verse 34. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandman that they might receive the fruits of it. According to plan, according to contract. And the husbandman took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. So I'm going to say at least two of these were killed. The one that was beaten, it doesn't say for sure. In verse 36, again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto him them likewise. They also killed them. Well, last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. And so those servants that they killed, that's the prophets. That's the men who were chastised, men who were beaten, men like Jeremiah who was placed into a pit, men like others who were just persecuted because they, they preached, thus saith the Lord to the nation of Israel and Judah, and they hated the message of God, they rejected the message of God, and they rejected the messengers of God, and it was the murderous acts that followed. In verse number 38, But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him, and cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. In verse 34, we see the expectation of the landowner. The landowner had every right to expect his share of the harvest. That was normal. That was not an unreasonable request. That was according to the agreement, the contract he made with these men. And he had already invested more in it than they had. I mean, he's already marked it off. He's already <clears throat> plowed it. He's already taken the stone out. He's planted the seed. All they have to do is sort of just care for it. And he put all the expense into it. He built the tower. He built the fence. Everything that was needed. He spared no labor. He spared no expense. And they just had to watch it and make sure to keep the animals out, the thieves out. And because vineyards pretty much grow by themselves, they would go in and they would prune uh, the vineyard so that it would bring forth as much fruit as possible. So the landowner had more in it than they had. And we see his expectation was just simply to send his servants there and collect his portion according to the contract. But in verse 35 and 36, we see the rejection of the servants. The husbandman took his servants and they beat one and killed another and stoned another. They rejected them. They said, no, well, we got a good thing going here. We're going to take care of these guys and maybe he'll just leave us alone and uh, he won't come back. But he did send more after that, more servants than the first time. And they killed them and they slew them. So the servants are rejected. These are the prophets. They were rejected. And then notice in verse 37 and following 39, the assassination of the son. Matthew 21, 42, Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures? Man, what a, what a rebuke right there just to the Pharisees and Sadducees. They were supposed to be expert on Jewish law. And he said, um, Did ye never read in the scriptures? The stone, now he's going to quote Psalm 118, verse 22. And he said, The stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Psalm 118.22 says, The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. So the Lord sent his son. God sent his son to the nation of Israel. That's his life when he came, born of a virgin, born in Bethlehem, prophesied for 500 years the Messiah would come, and yet they still missed it. 
And he said, because you didn't read the Scriptures, you didn't understand the Scriptures, so when he came, you thought him to be a fake and a farce. You thought him to be a phony, and you crucified the Son of God and the assassination of the Son. But Jesus, of course, was in the dead, and he died for us, died for our sins. God never is out of control. God knows what he's doing. And when things go wrong or seemingly go wrong, they're just going right. God has a greater purpose in mind. In verse 40, here is the searching question of the householder. In verse 40, When the Lord there are, there are, therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? What is he going to do? I mean, they, they have to be honest. I mean, there is no other answer except he's going to deal harshly with these men. He is going to do, in verse 41, here's the retribution upon the nation. They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men and let a husband you to other husbandmen which shall render him, under, uh, render him the fruits in their seasons. Now, if you'll go back and think about the story, that nation is the Gentiles. That nation is the church. And so God said, I'm going to take the vineyard that you have refused to give me the fruit thereof. Now, in the Old Testament, he said it brought forth wild grapes. And here he says he brought forth grapes, but you withheld them and you, you murdered the prophets and you, you crucified God's son, my son that I sent to you. You did not reverence him. And so the Bible says those are the Gentiles. That's the church. That's the church. That's you and I. God said I have taken it from Israel. My blessings. And I have put them upon the church. On the day of Pentecost when the Holy Ghost came upon the church, he empowered that church. He told them to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And so in verse 43, he says, Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, Gentiles, the church, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And since, listen, since the day of Pentecost, there have been more Gentiles saved than Jews. There have been a whole lot more Gentiles saved than Jews. They rejected it, and God rejected them. And if you go to 2 Corinthians 3.14, sometimes it says this, but their minds were blinded, for unto this day remain the same veil, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it, the nation shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. That won't happen until the tribulation period. They're not going to turn to the Lord, but God will reserve a remnant. Paul says, because of their rejection of the Messiah, they have a veil upon their eyes. And when the scripture is read and Moses is read and the scripture is preached, the veil is upon their heart. Now there are Jews saved. He's talking about as a nation. Like in Jesus' day, there were, there were people. The disciples were Jews. They got saved. Many others got saved. There were 500 uh, that saw him after the resurrection. They were saved. But as a nation, the nation rejected the Messiah. And it was given to another nation, the Gentile nation, which is the church. In the tribulation period, the Bible said in the book of Zechariah, one-third of the Jewish nation will be saved. One-third of the Jews will be saved, but not until the tribulation period. They'll be delivered, saved, and they will populate the millennial kingdom of Christ. God will reserve a remnant. But for the Gentiles, let's talk about the Gentiles for a moment. But for the Gentiles right now is that verse that says, Today is the day of your salvation. Now is the accepted time. 
And so the Gentiles, there is no veil upon their face. They can understand. They can hear the gospel. They can repent. They can believe. And I, you know, you can't get this across to people. This is your day. We talked about this morning, don't miss the day of your visitation. This is the day of your visitation until the rapture takes place and then God begins to work again with the Jewish nation and he chastises them through uh, the Antichrist and through the false prophet and they are, they are slaughtered by the thousands, if not millions, and they are saved. A third of the nation will be saved and turn to Christ. There will be 144,000 Jewish evangelists that are turned loose on the world. They are going to preach the gospel and one third of the nation is going to be saved. But now, today, us Gentiles, our families, it really applies today. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. And the Bible says for those Gentiles who have now heard the gospel, they understood the gospel, they rejected the gospel, Jesus said when, the, when Jesus comes back and the tribulation comes in, they will not be able to be saved. He said I, there will be a veil upon their heart then because they, they missed the day of their visitation. That's why we need to be vigilant about about getting the gospel to people and urging them. You've got to get saved before Jesus comes. If you don't, and you don't know when he's coming, so the safe thing to do is this. Today is the day of salvation. Right now is your accepted time. You can get saved right now, but you can't get saved tomorrow. You don't know if tomorrow's going to come or Jesus might come. And when he comes, Second Thessalonians 2 says that they will not be able to be saved. They heard it. The day of visitation came, and they missed it, and they won't be saved. That's this generation. Now, once you get into the tribulation period, the Bible says there will be untold numbers saved of every tribe and every language and every tongue shall be saved in that tribulation period. But it won't be those who heard the gospel before. It will be those who just heard it in the tribulation period from those 144,000 evangelists, the two witnesses, and other, just other people who get saved and spread the word. You can get saved. Gentiles can get saved. And they get saved now. If you've never heard the gospel, you can get saved now. And those who had heard the gospel, they won't be interested now. They won't be interested then. If they, if they don't care about getting saved now, they're not going to care too much about getting saved later. So we have, a great, we have a great blessing that God has taken the blessings of Israel, take them away, and put them upon us, the Gentile church. The Gentile church. What a blessing to be a child of God. What a blessing to be a, a child, a Christian in this day and age. I'm glad that when I got saved, I didn't miss the day of my visitation. I'm glad when I got saved, you got saved, that you didn't miss that day when God said, today's the day of salvation. I'm glad I heard his voice, responded to the voice, and I'm glad I repented and got on my knees and trusted him as my Savior. I'm glad to be saved. Amen. You know, the parables are just so um, uh, illustrative. They just illustrate these things in such a way you, you have a heart. Some of them are hard to understand, but like this one, he just, I mean, it's up front. It's, you know, it's the husbandman. We know who they are. They're the ones who killed the prophets. Those are the Jews, the Sadducees. And the thing about it, the, the, the Pharisees said, we perceive he's talking about us. <laughs> yeah. It's like somebody goes out the door and says, I think the preacher was preaching at me. Yeah, sometimes I am. And, uh, and so they understood that. But they rejected the Messiah. And it came to the Gentile church. So we have a great responsibility, just like the Jews have a great responsibility, to receive the Messiah. And they were supposed to be the light to lighten the Gentiles. Go back and read Isaiah and other places. They were to be a light that lightened the Gentiles. They were supposed to be preaching to us. Now we're preaching to them. Because again, they missed the opportunity to be saved and trust the Messiah. And they rejected him. And now God puts that burden on us. Our responsibility, it's a, it's a privilege. 
but it's also great responsibility. With every privilege comes a responsibility to do something with that privilege. Let's bow for prayer, please.